everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. This is sort of our first um, big seminar uh, coming off a bit of a summer break, and we hope everyone is getting back into the flow of things. Um, today's uh, presentation is actually a, a co-presentation of the Columbia Roy Ball Center for Fearless Behavior Change, as well as the um, um, SOBC initiative, the Science of Behavior Change. And so we welcome people who are coming from either groups. Um, both of these are based at the Center for um, um, Behavioral Cardiovascular Health at Columbia. And today I have the pleasure of introducing a colleague that we're getting to collaborate with. Um, she is the Assistant Director of the Center for Healthcare Delivery Sciences at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and also a member of the Brigham and Women's Hospital Roy Ball Center. And her clinical training is in as a pharmacist, and she currently is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She's done amazing research, particularly around um, interventions to improve adherence to medications, as well as other areas. And I welcome Julie to come talk to us today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to, to chat with you and, and share with you some of our work um, and look forward to your questions at the end as we go along. Um, and so what I want to do is really talk to you about kind of my thought process and thinking about how we can potentially get closer to delivering interventions for patients um, to address their adherence and, and, and try to support them in, in supporting their medication use. Um, and so what I, I want to do is just level set, and I know Ian's quite familiar with this area, um, but I want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page of why I care about how patients take medications and what the implications are, and why, why maybe you should care if this isn't something you're familiar with. Um, and the idea is just when we're thinking about chronic medications, and in this case, we're going to be talking about cardiometabolic or diabetes, um, hypertension kind of related conditions today, um, there's a lot of reasons for why um, adherence is actually poor. And the, adher the idea of adherence is um, really taking medications in the way that patients and providers have agreed upon. And what a lot of literature has suggested is that about one half of patients actually don't adhere to their medication. There's a lot of clinical and um, economic adverse consequences in the US related to this. And there's a lot of different barriers um, for why we don't see optimal adherence um, in the real world. There's a whole variety of reasons. Costs is one I know we hear about in um, the lay literature a lot, but there's other, um, other patient and system and medication specific issues that different interventions seek to address. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of adherence interventions have really only been modestly effective. Um, some of the most effective ones have typically been multi-component in nature, incorporating several different um, aspects of trying to address adherence. And several of them have involved pharmacists, which is why I'm giving you a couple of examples today of pharmacist-layered interventions. It's not because I'm a pharmacist and I believe pharmacists solve everything. It's just the literature suggests that um, as part of multi-component interventions, some of the most successful have involved pharmacists. But only about 50% of adherence interventions have really ever been shown to be successful on average. And I define success by seeing a positive effect. And there's many different reasons, of course, right? Perhaps the intervention didn't work. Um, there's a variety of reasons, but some of the ones I think that are kind of most useful to highlight today are they're not principle driven. Uh, maybe there isn't a, a strong conceptual framework behind why um, that intervention might work. Maybe it's not targeting the right kind of level, maybe it should have been a system level intervention, it was aimed at patients, maybe not the right mode of delivery. Uh, maybe it was kind of a limited nature of the intervention, it wasn't timed at the time that patients actually needed it. And finally, maybe it was kind of poorly targeted or designed for patients who really needed that specific intervention. Yet, most adherence interventions have typically been delivered as a one-size-fits-all or everything but the kitchen sink approach for patients. And what I mean by that is, you know, one of the most successful interventions in, in addressing costs has been actually reducing co-payments. Um, my colleague, Natish Chowdhury, led a really big study several years ago that reduced co-payments after heart attack um, for all patients within a health insurer. And it was successful in reducing cardiovascular, most of the cardiovascular outcomes, as well as improving adherence. But it was delivered to everybody, when actually, wouldn't it be more efficient 
um, and more efficient from a cost resource standpoint, if we could figure out who actually should receive an intervention. And there are several different modalities for how we might think about this. Perhaps, you know, like this um, reducing co-payment trial, we could deliver an intervention for all patients who may have that particular, you know, may, may need any help whatsoever with their medications. Maybe we're focusing on a condition or drug, like this cost trial already focused on patients um, who have recently had a heart attack. Maybe it's focusing on patients who have specifically controlled poor disease, who we've identified as currently having problems with adherence, but as, and, and, and maybe kind of moving more towards identifying those who, when we might deliver the intervention, seem to have a high likelihood of future non-adherence or not taking their medications. But wouldn't the holy grail be if we could figure out for which patient, which adherence interventions they would most respond to, that would ideally be the most effective, but it gets harder as you move up computationally more intensive um, and trying to figure that out gets a lot more difficult. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk through is kind of three different trials that march up this pyramid today <laughs> and us trying to think through how we might um, be able to target or personalize interventions a bit more specifically for patients. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the, this ENGAGE um, diabetes trial that we did a couple of years ago um, with this idea of if we target now um, more efficiently, perhaps patients who have current poorly controlled disease and poor adherence, um, there's a variety of reasons in thinking about diabetes, why there might be um, suboptimal adherence um, in diabetes. And so there's, it's a very complex condition, um, requires often diet, exercise, adherence, a variety of different self-management behaviors that people have to do. Um, but it's not always evident to clinicians or others who are seeking to help patients, which is the most relevant or the biggest issue that patients have. And so we took kind of a, a very, like we took a, an approach where we were trying to leverage different patient engagement techniques to like motivational interviewing, which you may have heard about, to try to understand the reasons why patients, individual patients were having difficulties with their diabetes. And then among the potential choices, like focusing on diet, exercise, adherence, intensifying treatments, for example, if there's some evidence that maybe they should be on more medication, using shared decision-making to try to understand um, what patients want to focus on. You know, we had seen kind of a gap in trying to be able to use both of those together to effectively try to target interventions um, within diabetes a little bit more specifically for patients with poor control. So this led us to um, basically conduct a design and conduct this engaged trial, um, which was leveraging really pharmacist delivered interventions. But what we were really interested in was this mechanism of this two step process of using brief negotiated interviewing, which is a type of motivational interviewing and shared decision-making and what impact it might have on glycemic control and adherence. And so we, I, and you know, focus of a lot of our interventions is mostly trying to identify patients in a scalable way, in a way that's identifying them from health systems in a way the intervention might otherwise be delivered without requiring a lot of informed consent that would undermine generalizability. And so we, um, did a database randomized control trial is what we call it um, and what others have called it, where we are identifying patients out of administrative insurer claims and lab data to try to understand and, and identify individuals who have some evidence of poor control and are on sort of the agents of interest. And so we randomized um, 1,400 patients we identified out of these data using um, these linked claims and lab values um, from a health insurer. And so really just to kind of start to look at this, we, identify, we randomized people to both receiving the intervention at all, which is this two-step process of understanding you know, what patients' motivations are and helping them to come up to with a decision about how they wanted to address their diabetes control versus usual care. And it's important to point out that we did this, you know, we were trying to do this in a scalable way. And so we had pharmacists actually call patients on behalf of the health insurer. And we assessed our outcomes in the same data by which we identified patients. And we did this over the 12 months after randomization. So we powered our study on glycemic control, which we defined as um, lab values from linked um, lab 
uh, vendors that were provided back to the insurer. And we looked at change in glycemic control from baseline to follow-up, which we defined here as this HbA1c. And so actually a drop in A1c, if you're less familiar, is generally um, a positive, is, is a positive outcome in this case. Um, and so we also compared with adherence, um, which we defined as um, basically the number of days that patients had medication available to them over the 12 months of follow-up. And so our study population, we equally randomized 700 folks to each usual care and intervention, and they were fairly well balanced at baseline. Kind of the first thing I just want to point out is that there's um, the groups had, you know, reasonably poor control. So just for anchoring purposes, a goal varies based on age, among other things, but, you know, good diabetes control for patients with diabetes is closer to the seven-ish range, eight if you're a little bit older. So a nine is actually relatively high on average. Um, and so what did we find? Well, we found basically no statistical difference in either of our two outcomes. We saw a drop, so an improvement in glycemic control in both groups, but it was equal. Um, and we saw improvements, like basically no difference in adherence. And so, um, you know, there's several reasons for this. It's the way that it was delivered, among other things, we'll come back to this um, at the end. But what we thought was interesting was looking you know, while we had done our primary analysis of courses and intent to treat, we did look a little deeper among those who actually received the pharmacist intervention. Because as you'll recall, we identified everybody and randomized them who was eligible for the data. We didn't restrict to those who agreed to get some sort of intervention or not, and then randomize them at that point. And so among those who were actually the 200 or so out of the 700 um, in the intervention group, who agreed to receive the intervention and go through this two-step process. We identified those folks and then matched them with similar folks based on the data in the usual care group. And so we did see actually an improvement when we went about doing it that way and a statistical improvement. So it basically showed to us that the efficacy was potentially there for those who received it, but on average and of the population, it may not have been very efficient. Um, but really what was interesting to us and thinking about targeting and tailoring interventions for patients is we did see some pretty diff large differences across the intervention group among those who actually dis agreed to get different aspects of how to improve the diabetes care. And what I mean by that is among those who wanted to focus on adherence, they actually had a relatively large HbA1c drop compared with those who wanted to just um, start a new medication, they actually didn't see a large HbA1c difference. Um, and so while this is you know, relatively exploratory, these are among the people who agreed to do different things. As a mechanism, um, what this means for us is that thinking about who wants what and trying to address that and, and try to answer those questions a little bit more specifically. And about 25% of the patients the pharmacist called were not ready to make any change whatsoever. So we were not able to deliver an intervention to those folks in a way that was kind of efficient. And so, you know, this trial was starting to get us think about, there's some lessons that we learned here. One is, you know, targeting was inefficient of these different diabetes interventions because patients weren't ready to make a decision. They didn't know what they wanted. They didn't know what they needed. So a large proportion of patients. And what I didn't get into is a large proportion of patients had actually identified something that the pharmacists felt a little bit less able to address because pharmacists largely focus on medications. We hadn't trained them as much as we could have on diet and exercise. And a large proportion of patients wanted to focus on there. So what our answers were were relatively generic. Um, and then there were other aspects of timing and integration of the intervention, which aren't really kind of the point of the talk today, but there are other things that could have led us to seeing kind of the overall null effect, um, but, you know, kind of the interesting kind of findings among those who received the intervention. So maybe patients don't know what they want, but maybe if we moved further up to using data to try to figure out what um, aspects of an adherence intervention might work for patients, uh, maybe that is another play that is worthy of consideration. So that led us to thinking about the target trial, where this idea of we could 
improve adherence interventions, if we had the same one, say a same pharmacist multi-component intervention, what if we, using data that we have available to us through, say, insurer data or EHR data, could change what patients received and the intensity of what they received, would we see a gain um, on the population level by trying to figure out and giving more kind of potency to the people who need the most and less potency to those who don't? Um, because a lot of adherence interventions, just adherence and, 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 and just interventions in general, have not necessarily been targeted to those who we think might mostly benefit. This gets back to this one size sort of fits all approach that a lot of prior interventions have taken. And conversely, you know, focusing efforts on those who are most likely to be non-adherent or those with poor disease control may be more effective um, when identifying patients within a population. So what we sought to do was test sort of an increasingly intensive intervention to more targeted population, and this time using some predictive methods in order to identify or uncover patients who we predict might be needing more help in the future. So rather than re relying on what patients needed. I don't know why that just did that. Okay. Um, and so that led us to doing the target trial, which um, we also did in diabetes with a, the same insurer, slightly different population. So you can kind of see some comparative differences um, between the two. And so we had three arms in this case. There was no usual care arm because what we were doing was actually focusing on insulin persistence in this case. The other trial is focused on oral diabetes medications. They were different populations. Um, and glycemic control. And so we had three different arms that we were doing. The first arm was kind of our basic multi-component pharmacist intervention, where we delivered that at a relatively low intensity to everyone who we had identified and randomized to that arm. The second arm delivered a slightly more intense intervention to some patients who we predicted based on prior medication use data, among other things, would need the most help in the subsequent year. And so about 60% of patients were contacted and delivered and, and received pieces of the intervention. And the other 40% of patients who were identified and randomized to that arm were actually not touched at all. We, let, we delivered it like usual care. So this idea of it's a little bit more increasingly targeted. And then arm three, we actually were even more intensive. And so we combined both predictive analytics and data about how they, what their level of disease control was to essentially deliver the most intensive multi-component pharmacist intervention we could do over the telephone and you know electronically um, that was super intensive to 40% of the people in that arm. And we did not touch the other 60% who were not per, who were not predicted to need as much help. And so all three arms were designed to cost the same and require the same level of resources. And we tested it all at intention and an attention to treat level among everyone who was randomized to all three arms, regardless of whether they received anything or not. And so just to kind of illustrate a little bit further what that looks like, we randomized 2000, roughly 2,000 patients to each arm. Only a certain percentage received the intervention, and they varied based on the number of pharmacist contacts, um, whether text messages were provided, whether there was more intensive clinical follow-up after the, the pharmacist call, et cetera. So what did this practically look like? Um, we identified it within the same insurer based on laboratory data, data that were linked as well. Um, we identified 6,000 patients who were on insulin already as a diabetic. And so essentially, this is re-showing how the different levels of targeting happened for ARM1, ARM2, and then ARM3, with this idea of predicting those who needed the most help and assigning kind of those where we thought there might be the most um, effective targeting. In this case, actually, we focused on the middle band of patients who were um, had some evidence of non-adherence, um, but were clearly using their insulin. Um, and so we thought we called that kind of high value targeting um, and trying to kind of focus on those patients as the ones who got the pharmacist intervention. And we assessed our outcomes in this case um, in the data 12 months after randomization, kind of similar to the other one. In this case, we did an insulin persistence measure. It's kind of a, a funny thing about adherence measures within um, claims data 
as in large part because insulin is delivered a little bit less episodic, like consistently um, compared with oral medications. And so we focused really on gaps in how people were filling their insulin rather than a proportion measure the same as the oral meds. Um, and we also compared it with glycemic control. And so our population was relatively comparable, um, as you can see in kind of this, the, the thing really just to highlight here is that patients were a little bit more controlled already on average with their HbA1c compared with the other study, and this is more the eights, um, but otherwise relatively um, comparable. So what did we find? Well, we found that there was no difference in our adherence or our persistence measure to insulin. We um, saw, you know, only about 5% based on the metric that we were using for this study were non-persistent relatively similarly across all three arms. Um, but we did find, and this was interesting um, to uncover, that there was an, a, a change in HbA1c or glycemic control in a good way, and that a, a glycemic control improved um, in really a dose response fashion in all three arms. And so compared with previously, before we identified them for the study, um, we saw basically no change on average across all 6,000 patients, regardless of whether they were targeted or not. Um, um, a slight change in arm one, a little bit bigger change in arm two, and a, a larger change on average in arm three. And so this arm three versus arm one in particular was statistically significant on average across the population. And while I'm not kind of getting into the details today, when we did focus on those who received the intervention, the response was much um, bigger. But what this sort of started to teach us, perhaps, is that, you know, while the intervention didn't improve persistence, it did improve this population level glycemic control, which, um, you know, to the there's several reasons for why we think it improved glycemic control versus persistence. Um, but this is setting us up for thinking about how we might be able to potentially target interventions or to pers like deliver them more in a more tailored way for patients, um, potentially using data that's already available. And in particular, kind of combining this idea of predicted risk of non-adherence in the future and their level of disease control really just may be more effective at the population level versus untargeted approaches. So perhaps there's a promise in thinking about doing this a little bit more within data. But of course, anyone who runs trials, when you don't have a positive, uh, like a significant outcome on your primary outcome, you do have to kind of uncover why that might happen, like the mechanisms behind why that might happen. And so, um, you know, I think rule, thing number one is that our persistence measure was a binary outcome and wasn't particularly sensitive. We were kind of forced to use that measure, um, but it, I think it wasn't really all that sensitive. Second is, you know, maybe we didn't get our predictions right. Of course, we may still have, we may have gotten somehow something about glycemic control correctly, but there just wasn't a lot of room to grow or we didn't get the predictions right about it here, um, about insulin persistence in general. And maybe just, um, you know, again, this dose response means that we could think a little bit more about also who the really high risk patients are. So if we were to think about doing this approach or similar approaches in the future, you know, we would want to explore a different measure um, we want to think a little bit more about how we could further optimize targeting and delivery of interventions. So a bit of a, a leap then, but our, our last kind of approach into thinking about how we might tailor or personalize interventions is a trial we recently completed and now we're doing follow-on work with, um, which is called our reinforced trial. It's much smaller than the other two. Um, and it's sort of a proof of concept one that was funded by our Roybal Center here. So the goal behind this is that, you know, there are aspects of interventions that patients are carrying with them all the time, right? Um, people have smartphones with them at all times, practically at all times. And there's opportunity to provide kind of ongoing intervention in that way especially for something like diabetes, where they're spending a lot of their time managing conditions at home and not relying on receiving information from, you know, infrequent visits they may be having with their providers or other um, healthcare personnel they're interacting with, even pharmacists. And um, many of these technologies could be delivered at relatively low cost. They can provide lots of information within them, leaving aside differences between texts and, and apps and other types of mobile health. Um, Virtually all of these kind of style of interventions have used 
generic or kind of one size fits all content. Get back to the theme of today, even though, you know, as many of you know, increasing evidence is showing that across a variety of contexts, patients have, and providers too, everyone has varying responses to different types of timing, content, framing, and information that's provided to them. But trying to figure out what people need at what moments and over time has historically been relatively difficult. And so we've explored this idea of using reinforcement learning, which is a machine learning strategy, kind of sits between unsupervised and supervised learning. It's a different type of approach, but it, it's based on behavioral science in that um, it's using a feedback loop where it's testing how timing and framing of different um, cues that are provided to individuals and seeing what the feedback is to that over and over and over time. And so as time goes on, it learns and personalizes and predicts what content, timing, et cetera, that people are most likely to respond to on an individual basis. And so this idea has actually been used to some degree already in computer gaming and robotics, this idea, even if it's not quite the same thing, but Netflix continuing to personalize to you, this is effectively this idea behind it. And so in the context of adherence, what we might do is observe daily actions about how people are taking their medications, provide to them, say, a text message that includes some information that's predicted to kind of work best for that individual. And then we receive the next day, based on how patients are taking the medication, um, whether those predictions were accurate. So if you've heard of things like just-in-time adaptive interventions, this, I, this idea of kind of changing and receiving what patients are getting over and over is a just-in-time adaptive intervention. So we can layer reinforcement learning on top to actually tell it the decision rules for what how it's adapting. And that's effectively how these two components fit together. So we tested this on a small scale um, where what we were really interested in doing was testing the feasibility and potential effectiveness of it. And so we tested this text messaging program where we tailored it using reinforcement learning and adherence. And we did it in our own healthcare system, just submitted the IRB right when COVID started. So they didn't review it for several months, which was really fun. Um, but it's a, it was a fun learning lesson for how we thought we were gonna do this all in person and how we could flip this to actually make it work completely virtually, never actually seeing or meeting patients at all. And so we did this um, using EHR data, kind of a similar approach where we're kind of identifying people um, through EHR data. And so we had slightly more criteria than some of the other studies, but kind of the highlights are um, they had to have some degree of poor disease control and really be using oral medications because the, the way in which we were seeing how patients were taking their medications relied on giving them electronic pill bottles in this case. So these are different than what um, retail pharmacy pill bottles are, but they kind of look similar if you've ever heard of them. Bas basically, they open, they look, they kind of, the other ones we used were orange and more similar to the patient's medications they get from the pharmacy, but they capture the dates and times of how people are using medications as they're opening them. And so the intervention group got these electronic pill bottles and they were feeding this daily information. It was appended to the prediction data set. Um, and basically the algorithm was personalizing over time using predictions to figure out what text messages patients would receive. And how did it actually predict what text messages patients should receive? Well, we actually had to tell it how different text messages were coded based on behavioral factors. And so because we had a relatively small study, we chose five different behavioral factors that the text messages were all different on, on, their ba on that basis. And so they changed somewhat based on their framing, whether we provided direct information about how they were taking their medications, um, like the number of days they took it in the last seven days, whether it included a social component, something about um, their loved ones, for example, um, mentioning their loved ones, whether it was intended to provide information or whether it was intended to be a reminder. And lastly, whether it was intended to provoke, we thought about this one a little bit, whether it was intended to provoke reflection. 
Um, and so it was not intended to be bi-directional feedback. For example, patients were not actually being asked to provide responses, although sometimes they did, particularly for these reflection-oriented text messages that were kind of asking them a, a question they might otherwise um, be thinking about. And so we had designed 128 text messages whereby there were at least two or three unique ones that fit each of these factors. So we had to provide to the tech, the algorithm unique sets of text messages that would fit all of these factors. And so for each patient, they were predicting every day which factor set they should receive. So as, as a unique factor set, each row is say a factor set here. And so to kind of reduce if patients were getting a similar factor set over time, we had two or three kind of text messages that fit those factor sets. And so the algorithm is effectively predicting the factor set based on how patients were responding um, in previous days to that type of content um, and kind of other fixed factors about themselves. And I should, I should add, um, we didn't develop our own algorithm. We leveraged one that is actually publicly available and, and available for linking from Microsoft Personalized. There are others um, kind of exploring reinforcement learning have built their own. We decided to use one that was out there. And so our outcomes in this case were data from the electronic pill bottles specifically, and those were provided to both groups, I should add. So it wasn't just the intervention, the group that got them, it was anyone randomized to the control group as well. Um, so we were kind of flushing out any differences from receiving these electronic pill bottles. And kind of the interesting thing here is to start to try to understand not only is personalization or using reinforcement learning to personalize, something that has promise for changing behavior, like as a mechanism. After we completed the study, we actually took a step back and I'll show you these results to try to look at these different five sets of factors and see which ones were associated with different patient characteristics and whether we could identify clusters of patients and how they respond to different types of text messages. And so kind of the highlights here is that um, by, we randomized 31 to the, the control group and 29 to the intervention group. And there were some imbalances by nature of being a relatively small study, which we incorporated into um, the actual um, adjustment plans. But patients had, you know, like before, relatively uncontrolled HbA1c, about nine on average. Um, and most of them were taking one medication, some were taking two. And um, we did not, in this case, based on data we had available, restrict to patients who had previously been non-adherent. Um, if you've ever worked in adherence, self-reporting, whether you're taking your medication or not, is generally um, not always a helpful metric because a lot of people will say that they're taking the medications, but actually not be taking them in the way that they would be expecting. It's a high, relatively insensitive. So we actually didn't restrict to that. But we had a healthy mix of patients who had previously said they had trouble taking their medications versus not. And so before we get into the results, um, there were a few things we started off first to see whether it was evolving over time. Was the algorithm even changing? And so actually what was interesting to us is the text they varied somewhat, but a lot of patients got a lot of positive texts, a lot of social texts, content and reflective. We think this probably related to small sample size. But over time, the ability for the model to explain patient responsiveness in terms of adherence, the ability for the model to predict adherence based on the factors included in the text actually improved over time. The adjusted R squares improved kind of on average over time. So it seemed to look like there was some evidence the model was evolving and continuing to personalize a little bit more. And what you know, what you do see that over time, it did sort of on average make preferences for different patients. This is a, a plot of kind of how patients changed and whether they received different types of factors over time, comparing on the left here, positive framing versus negative framing. Kind of on average, it preferred positive framing over time and less commonly um, negative framing. But of course, it, it changed a little bit depending on the person. And so when we actually look at on average across between intervention and control, um, the intervention group did experience about a 14% absolute increase in adherence um, compared with control um, over this entire six-month period. Um, and what was interesting to us specifically is that 
you know, you started to see some differences that highlight how we might, um, you know, scale this up is we saw in particular that, you know, as a clinician, it makes sense um, that those who were closer to borderline disease control needed about 9%, needed, you know, maybe not new medication, but needed to focus on their adherence, for example, saw a lot more benefit than those who were more uncontrolled than that. Because typically it makes sense because at a nine to 10% HbA1c level, you might be adding more medication rather than focusing on the medication that patients are already taking. So these types of things, um, for example, kind of spoke to us in thinking about, okay, yeah, clinically this makes sense. But on average, it seemed to also work. But then we took a step back to kind of look at, okay, now, you know, worked on average, but did we see any differences about how people responded? Of course, this is relatively small. These are, we're talking to 29 patients in the intervention group. But we did start to see perhaps if you compare kind of rows and look within rows, um, some differences in patient characteristics and how they responded over time in terms of how adherent they were to different types of the message framing. And so, for example, we compared within different demographic groups kind of for this, for this purpose. And if you look at the row comparing patient sex and male versus female, so among patients who were um, identified as female versus male, they were more likely to um, respond to getting information about how they were taking their messages, um, their observed feedback, and were kind of less likely to actually respond to other types of framing, um, including, for example, social framing. Um, versus men, which we thought was kind of interesting, highly exploratory, but kind of showing and I, that there may have been some differences in how people responded to different types of, of content and framing um, on average over time. Um, and then when we did some clustering to kind of look at, are there unique clusters of patients who responded to different types of kind of framing? Um, we used essentially K-means clustering to identify the clusters. We found kind of three different groups made sense within the data that we were working with, these 29 patients. And so these three groups, you know, seem to be potentially in this case, a group that's really most adherent in relation to them getting information about how they've been taking their medication or observe feedback. And then a group in yellow, a smaller group that seemed to respond kind of best to social types of reinforcement texts about loved ones, for example, or information about how they've been taking their medications. And then finally, a group that comprised kind of most patients who were seen to respond at, you know, equally to all types of messages. But at least this is sort of the setting up us for thinking mechanistically, perhaps personalization and thinking about personalizing in this case, adherence interventions on a small scale about how, whether, you know, reminders, information, all that sort of type of things about diabetes could be tailored differently to patients and that there are potentially groups within there who do respond differently um, in terms of what information is provided to them. So hy you know, hypothetically, we've seen this in other cases, but it hadn't really been done in this context of, of adherence. And so we, we do see some sort of promising patterns in this case. So kind of thinking about all three trials put together, um, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, we covered today, but, um, you know, thinking, highlighting for us that timing and integration is important, um, especially when most of these cases we've been using routinely collected data to target and sort of measure the interventions. And that, you know, all three sort of start to highlight um, that targeting of interventions or information might be useful to different patients. And that kind of lastly, if we're kind of trying to figure out how to personalize or target, you know, predictive analytics um, seem to have an approach and reinforcement learning is this last example um, kind of maybe promising in order to kind of facilitate how to actually do this. And so before we get to questions, which I'm, I'm really happy and, and excited to answer, I just want to make sure to acknowledge um, the team who um, clearly was really helpful in doing this work and um, my co-PI on all three of these projects, actually, in Atish Chowdhury. So with that, I just want to say thank you and uh, look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you, Julie. That was super, super interesting and um, really clearly presented. Um, so everybody, if you have any questions, please place them in the chat and I'll read them out to, to Julie.
And, you know, while you're thinking of potential questions, I'll kind of start off with, you know, one or two. Um, so the first question in, in the, the, the third trial, um, the, um, gosh, I'm already like on the name, but the, the, okay. what's the third one called again? Reinforce. Is Sorry, what we reinforce. Said, yep. Yeah. Um, what, was the control group getting no messages or were they getting just like gen generic messages that were not personalized at all? That's a super question. Um, and I think that the, the biggest, one of the biggest criticisms we've been getting when we've presented or, or publishing this, we actually chose deliberately because it was a pilot project to not give the usual care group any text messages. Um, and so we were comparing in this case, personalized text messages versus no messages. Um, but we were trying to kind of show the proof of concept and feasibility and so now we're in the process of trying to scale this up. And the goal would be actually having interventions where there's closer to usual care, a group with you know generic text messages and a group that personalizes it. Because ultimately that would be the right way to really test personalization as a mechanism. Um, but for now, um, you know, 14% difference in adherence is something that generally we get pretty excited about. So it's likely um, hypothesizing that it's going to be somewhere in the middle if we were to do generic texts based on prior work. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll read out a question um, by someone in the audience, um, someone Choi, hopefully I'm saying your name okay, um, wrote, hi, great talk. I'm curious if you created your own text message bank um, or interviewed patients to develop the message content. So just wondering yeah, how, you, how you kind of came up with the, how, how much were patients involved in sort of thinking about the things that might move the needle, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, great question. Um, we did both, <laughs> actually. Something I skipped um, was we, this project had really two aims, this reinforced trial at the end. And the first aim, we interviewed about 20 patients with diabetes in the same health system before we did the trial, both to kind of pressure test, like, do patients want text messages? Of course, in other contexts, there's good work kind of showing acceptability of text messages, but in, in, our specific use case, we weren't really sure. And so we showed them even some example texts that we'd worked through and got some initial feedback. And what was kind of interesting is we had some early signs based on the interviews that patients really did not think negatively framed messages would work, both kind of for them at least, both for thinking about how consequences were framed. Like if you don't do something, you will not experience it. The not not kind of idea was something that they weren't sure would work. And they like to think positively also about like what benefits they might have as opposed to missing out on something. And so they all kind of said, you know, I don't know about that. And loved ones, you know, some, again, now having done all these interviews, a lot of women were like, I already know I'm doing some of these things for my family. You don't have to remind me. And so not totally surprised to see some of the, you know, the, the preliminary results, but we did end up kind of taking what we learned from the interviews and some text message we'd used in prior work um, to eventually develop our own text messaging bank that was informed um, by patients. And so now um, we're hoping to do a bit more kind of testing of those messages as we scale up and potentially test more factors. Great. So I have another question for you. Um, um, well, actually, I don't want to hog the, the spotlight. There are actually two more questions. Let me let me stick with There's one more question from the audience. Um, this is from Michelle Waz Wadowski. Um, she asked, how well did patients adhere through the duration of the study? Did you have patients fall off towards the end, wondering if the novelty of receiving texts were off or anything like that? Yeah, super smart question. Um, so the... The answer is, you know, we saw actually, I don't have a graph for this, a relative split relatively quickly between the intervention and control group that actually persisted over time. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks are always funny and a lot of other prior work that's been work done with electronic pill bottles, actually they throw away the first month of data a lot because patients are in both groups really kind of playing around with the bottles. But they've really shown that over time, about two weeks to a month in, the novelty like relatively wears off and you're getting basically how patients are using the medication. So by, you know, we, we kind of tried to overcome that by giving them in both groups. Um, but it's, you know, in general, um, you know, the, the novelty of the tech, the pill bottles, which isn't what you're asking about, you know, should have worn off. 
And the text messages, one thing we'd like to do in an, another iteration, we were primarily adapting here um, on the content we were providing to people, so the what. But what we could do and other just-in-time adaptive interventions have focused on is adapting the when uh, information is provided. We haven't seen that marriage yet of what and when, um, which is something we're really interested in exploring. And so by kind of, we could actually also adjust the timing and not provide patients texts every day. Um, and so that's kind of a 2.3.0 version we're kind of working on. Um, Julie, can you just clarify how, how frequent were the text messages? And... We did them daily. So it had a function of it not providing a text, but by and large, it provided a text. But there are ways that we can improve the model to actually predict sort of when more deliberately. And so okay. for now, patients were receiving up to daily messages. And, and sorry, how long did the trial run for? Six months. Six months, okay. Um, I don't know, just in terms of the, that methodology, what did you do if patients had multiple oral diabetes medications, did they have multiple pill bottles or you sort of picked one of them and how did you decide if that was the case? Great qu yeah, question. Um, we actually gave them pill bottles for both, like several of their medications. So they could have up to three. Um, and we did see, I can't remember if we had this in the figure or not. I think, yeah, they're in this uh, graph. We didn't see a big difference between whether we had provided one medication or two or more in terms of their adherence um, uh, between the intervention and the control group. Um, but we stopped at three and relatively few people had three diabetes medications, mostly because multiple pill bottles might get confusing for patients. So there are pill box approaches, which we've considered, but the, they're kind of less validated in this context. So we've really been focusing more on um, pill bottles in particular. And it's more just a technicality. How did you handle as like if someone's refill ended? Were they expected to sort of transfer their pills into the electronic pill bottle? Was there any sort of checking of that, or you sort of left patients to sort of stay at yeah. that part of it? Yeah, we we did not in the purpose of trying not to kind of over engineer or, or introduce lots of co interventions. We didn't proof how people were adding things to the pill bottles. We figure that. Patients are, you know, adding medications to pill bottles or pill boxes all the time on their own. Um, and so we're kind of mirroring how people normally um, deal with medications. Of course, there was like a number for them to call out or whatnot if there were questions. But it is something I've seen in other studies, are the ways these electronic pill bottles are used. It's say, for example, in like the cancer specialty medicine space, they're actually sending them kind of new pill bottles and instructing them more routinely about how to kind of transfer them. And so in other use cases, they are kind of a lot more deliberate about following people and seeing how they're doing it. It's a really good question. Um, and sorry, we're focusing, focusing on the last trial. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with one of the other Roybal centers based at Northwell. They're testing like N of one trial designs. And I'm wondering, like, and I think they actually, I, can't, I don't know if they've done a medication adherence one, but um, I, we had worked on some, we'd thought through this beforehand. Like uh, another approach to doing this is you might have tried um, several different types of messages, like in a sequence. Um, and then for each individual, over time with each individual location, as they sort of did the different sequences, you might have learned that way, which one, and then you sort of, as you've tried each sequence once or twice, or however you designed it. Um, you could then sort of just maintain the one that seemed to work the best and the sort of, as you looked at the prior sequences, I'm just wondering if you guys thought about that type of design and how you picked the design that you picked in the end, or maybe that you thought of that design beforehand. Yeah. Interesting. I, you know, I honestly am still kind of learning a bit more about it of one. Um, I think they're really fascinating and I think they could be used in this context. Um, I, you know, this approach is kind of a, this is not exactly the answer to your question, but it is kind of a micro-randomized trial and that it is kind of re-randomizing people and what they're receiving. And so it's different from an NF1. Um, and we just, you know, we honestly just have not actually explored this, but I think that it could be used uh, for this type of problem. Um, the other thing that we've thought about, which could be applied to NF1 trials or, or not, but um, is the idea that as you have more and more patients go through this protocol, you might learn what's best for the average patient um and so the idea of sort of you, you do like a warm start based on prior data i think, the, I think that's the word people have called it before um so at least at the beginning 
everyone is getting on average a pretty good intervention. And then over time, it gets better and better as you get more inputs. So I'm just wondering if that's sort of where you guys are thinking of going in the future. Yeah, that's sort of what it does. And actually, we you can use the same sort of starting set starting points for where it ends, and then it will adapt to kind of to new patients effectively. Um, we'll probably start over just because when we kind of test the set scale, because it'll be a there's several things that will be different um, when we get to test this more broadly. We'll have multiple languages incorporated, and so language will be part of the factors that it'll adapt on. Um, and there's kind of other kind of features that we'll do, but you can use, and, and certainly kind of the output from what we hope will be the, a bigger trial coming from this, is the finishing point. And that's what the clusters and other kind of um, elucidating whether they're different demographic differences is that that could be this, yeah, kind of warm starting point um, by which other interventions could start from and not have to start from scratch um, within their population. Great. So I'm going to go back to the audience. Um, so uh, Joe Schwartz has a comment and a question. So the comment first is lovely set of three studies and great capital letters presentation. So I wanted you to make sure you heard the good feedback. Um, and he had a question um, is that his impression is that the explanation for people's non adherence tends to differ between people, which is sort of the underlying premise, a little bit of sort of what the text messaging are going to probably differ between people. Um, and so he goes on, for example, my non-adherence might be due to just forgetting, but someone else might intentionally decide not to take their medication and others don't refill them. Have you tried to incorporate these individual, individual differences in the type of non-adherence into your interventions? Um, that's, so a, that's a great question. So I, I would love to be able to know that at scale, um, but we did incorporate this and this is kind of work that Ian, the 2.0 version of an intervention that we're working on this year. Um, between our two Roybal centers is actually we tested a couple years ago an, an intervention that was again multi-component pharmacist intervention embedded in a healthcare system where part of what they were identifying before they met with their pharmacist with a research assistant was actually what patients biggest barriers to adherence might be and so the intervention that the pharmacist delivered was actually tailored based on what those barriers were for example forgetfulness or belief about the medication being important. So the pharmacist was a bit primed to knowing what kind of outputs to be providing to patients. And so we, we, you know, we've tried to incorporate that at least in this context. It'd be really cool if somehow we could figure that out from data and be able to know without having to interview patients. But at least that's something we tested and it was effective enough that now we're trying to figure out how to scale it up um, with Ian's group. And it might be super interesting to incorporate that into the reinforced type of design where you have more sort of self-report data at the beginning that you can kind of go back to you and see how those link to the message, the different messages to have more, more predictive input at the beginning, I guess. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, so one last question before we run out of time um, by Uma Subrayan, such an amazing talk. Um, so I think her question has to do with, um, we've talked a lot about differences within individuals in the context of diabetes. I think her question is, do we think these principles apply across conditions or is it gonna be different? So I'll just read her question out. Have you ever done testing in a patient group that has immune compromise, such as cancer, um, that takes multiple medications? Do you think that the medication adherence would be different intervention versus control compared to like working with the diabetes population? That's a great question. I think there's kind of two different answers to that. One is we know that even in the, you know variety of different conditions, adherence as a, is still a challenge, right? Regardless of whether it's oral chemo medications by which you would imagine patients would know that they, um, like there wouldn't be barriers to believing that the medication is important, we hope, <laughs> but there's still barriers to adherence even in other types of populations. So the ceiling effect may be different for certain medications. Like we may be starting at a better non-adherence level than other, than other conditions, which we do see in the literature, but we know that there still are problems. And we know that there are relatively persistent effects of taking, adding on medications and polypharmacy across conditions. So I would imagine that even in an immunocompromised standpoint, um, adherence and the problems and, and kind of general approaches, I think would also apply. What would be kind of interesting is that I would imagine that the underlying kind of behavioral factors and mechanisms and what would probably motivate people differentially would probably be different and kind of specific to the different conditions um, of interest. I was just editorialized, you know, I think the adherence field, there's so many studies across many years, 
which you kind of summarized a bit at the beginning and where I think the field's really trying to have some cumulative understanding so that it's not like each pet person is doing their pet project and we can really leverage and, and show what sort of general principles and how they apply. So I, um, it's a great, great question. Thank, thank you for your answer. Very last, uh, sorry, one more minute. Last question was by Jeff Burke, which I think he sort of, he was wondering about whether you thought there might be differences based on marital status. Cause I think he realized maybe that it wasn't statistically significant, but just wonder if you had any, any thoughts about um, how women and men or, you know, who are or are not partnered, um, I, I could be men and men partnered, obviously, and all the, um, but just wondering how, how you guys think about customizing based on those factors. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, we didn't see a statistical difference, as you pointed out, but there was um, some spread between potentially those um, who were single actually experiencing a slightly um, but non significant benefit compared with control. Um, but I, you know, I, I think it's partly just about who is the intervention for. Do we? What do we think the, the conceptual reason behind why this intervention was work would work? I would not think that kind of an individually delivered text messaging program would be one that I would expect kind of massive differences by married partner status, unless you start to get into. Um, perhaps like both partners having diabetes, for example, and then there being shared behaviors. And I think in that context, I, may, I might see differences, but otherwise I would imagine kind of at the individual level, both kind of both being affected. I think I've also seen some interventions where they've had um, the text message reminders could go to like another person, like another family member. So it could go to their, their partner um, to see if that, or, you know, if it's an elderly patient with some cognitive issues and might go to like their child or their caregiver. Um, so that would be interesting, to, you know, way to potentially strengthen, but also potentially sabotage <laughs> um, the the approach. Yeah, sure. Um, I forgot about that. Totally good point. Julie, thank you so much for um, presenting your, your work today. We really are having fun working across Warbell Centers with with you and your group, and look forward to continuing the dialogue and and finding opportunities to collaborate. And thank you very much for everyone who joined the session. I'm sure if you want to reach out to Julie separately, she'd welcome you know, further discussion of, of her work. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Julie. Bye. Take Thank care. you. Bye.